aspects about that today. And I would like to welcome Sandra Guthman, uh, our Hugh McGill from Northern Trust, uh, <laughs> Kenise, and, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, Kenise uh, Prendergast, uh, Dorsey Waxter, and our moderator, Brooke S. Mason. So I'm going to hand it over to the uh, appropriate people here, but thank you all for coming. We do appreciate it. Hi, I'm Brooke Mason. I'm U.S. correspondent for the art newspaper. I've covered the market for over a decade. I wrote for the Financial Times for three years, Bloomberg for three years on the market. So we're going to explore the challenge of collecting today. So I want to introduce everyone. Here's Hugh McGill, Northern Trust, Chief fiduciary officer and national director of trust services. He's going to be talking about managing and protecting a collection. Then we have Sandra Guffman, who's been chairman of the Polk Brothers Foundation since 1988, also served as their CEO, vice chairman of various funds in the fund complex of Northern Funds. And she's also trustee of Rush University Medical Center, Wellesley College, Harris Center for Music and Dance, and the Chicago High School for the Arts. Then we move on to Kenneth Prendergast, who built and has been building the formidable art collection of the Booth School of Business within the University of Chicago. We move on to Dory. Dorsey Waxter, who's president of the American Association of Art Dealers in New York and who is a dealer herself. Uh, can I remember? Yeah, okay. So what I'm going to do is start by pointing out my observations of the market, the results of an AXA insurance uh, survey of 1,000 collectors, and the market analysis report for the European Fine Art Fair in Maastricht, Holland. Um, so first I want to talk about the growth of this fair. It's only three years old. It's become more global. It's got Blaine Southern from Berlin, London. It's got Listen Gallery, London, Milan, New York. Marlborough, New York, London, Madrid, Monaco, Barcelona. So I think it's important to remember that in 1970, there were three international art fairs, Cologne, Basel, Brussels. Ten years later, Art Chicago came on the scene. So it's a really early pioneer in the development of international fairs. And you know, we see so many online ventures of art, but what's interesting is that, according to AXA, 73% still prefer shopping at a fair. And the one big change we've seen in the market is the huge appetite for living artists and the fact that Overwhelmingly, collectors favor contemporary art. It's not like in the early 20th century where we had the focus on old masters, 19th and 20th century. There's been a huge shift. And it's important to remember that the market is global. It's not just New York. And one of the ways we can talk about the global nature of it is that last year, Sotheby's had bidding from 72 countries. And that's extraordinary when you think it wasn't that so long ago. It was Europe, it was the US. Um, and last year, this is another sign of the growth of the market, is that Christie's rang up over a billion dollars. And so now we're going to move on to Sandra, who's going to discuss building a collection early on. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, a little bit of uh, history of our collecting. My husband and I 
got married in 67, and in 69 we went to New York. I think we must have finally paid off Yale Law School. And we, um, Jack suggested that there were art galleries that we might uh, just drop in and visit. They were up on Madison Avenue um, then, which is funny because everything comes full circle. The galleries in New York are moving back to the Upper East Side. Uh, but in those days, there were print galleries there, and uh, we have no art training. Um, I think I went to one history of art lecture when I was in college. Uh, but um, that was formative because we collect now, as we like to describe it to people, by shoe leather, uh, by walking around, by going to galleries, by looking a lot. So we started with prints, um, which is, you know, there were some wonderful printmakers back in the uh, late 60s and 70s, and we started with those and then uh, <clears throat> moved to uh, abstract expressionism, paintings, minimalism, um, and now we're kind of stuck on conceptual photography. So we started buying photography back in the 80s and... Um, really have carried forward with that. We like paintings, uh, we look for paintings, but the things that seem to speak to us most are uh, conceptual photography pieces. Um, so we, uh, we go to art fairs, uh, a few, not as a full-time taste, but it's a great way to get a survey um, of what's going on. And in, while we travel a lot, you couldn't travel as much as you would need to to go to all the art galleries that show up at art fairs. Uh, so this is a uh, you know, wonderful opportunity for us for sort of a survey of what's going on and um, gives you some reach. Um, back in the late 80s, we decided that the, what was the most fun for us was collecting young artists. Um, Maybe it's children's substitute, I don't know, but we're very proud of them when they do well, and uh, even if they don't become overnight sensations, we still love the work. Uh, but um, it was, uh, Brooke mentioned the global nature of the art mm -hmm. fair, uh, of the art world today, and I have a wonderful example of that um, that sort of wraps up where we're at. Um, when we go to an art fair like this one, everyone, every art fair has a section for young galleries, uh, like Exposure here, and that's where we usually head first, because we like to be, you know, we're not on the bleeding edge, but try to get close. And so we were at Freeze a couple of years ago, we headed back to their back corner, and came upon an art gallery uh, called Experimenter, which is a gallery from Calcutta. And um, they were showing a number of artists, uh, one of whom was name, is named Bani Abadi. She actually had a piece in the last documenta. She's a Pakistani artist who works in Berlin. And so we now own that piece, uh, which we, uh, is from a Pakistani artist who works in Berlin, uh, showing with a Calcutta gallery who brought her piece to a London art fair where we bought it and now hang it in Chicago. And, you know, what more can I say? Um, so uh, we go, we look, uh, we're now, uh, we have our favorite galleries. We try and buy in Chicago when we can. Uh, we, we like to support the local art scene. Uh, but we also buy in New York and uh, have our favorite galleries in Chelsea. But now we've started going, uh, I think the last two trips to New York, we headed for the Lower East Side. So as I said, it's fun to uh, discover young galleries, to buy pieces out of a first show and then watch what happens. And uh, we get a lot of pleasure from the art always. And if they're successful, uh, we cheer for them from the sidelines. So I think I'll end it there. and. Save a little for okay. later. Now, Dorsey is going to address so changing taste, changing collecting patterns, and the growth of the fair from the point of view of the dealer. Do we have a, a, a visual? Actually, I don't know. If, is Patricia here? There was a visual she was going to put up, but I'll just I'll give you the uh, synopsis of the visual. Um, first, it's there it is. Oh, there it is. Oh, yeah, no, this, that's the auction house. I was looking for an ad. Um, it's a Francis Bacon, most expensive work of art ever sold. 
I can't remember the price. It was 143 okay. million. Well done, Dorsey. Mm-hmm. And here we go, Northern Trust, who sponsored this. I think it, it could probably go a little bit further. Maybe it's it's a, it's an ad with a Philip Gustin in it. They're, they're trying to pull it out. Oh. Well, let me let me let me <laughs> move forward, and we'll find it. Um, first, I just wanted to repeat what Brooke was saying. I'm president of the Art Dealers Association of America, um, and I'm also a partner in a gallery in New York called Van Doren Waxter, and we're participating in the fair here, booth uh, 519. Um, So the Art Dealers Association of America is an organization of 180 members from around the United States, uh, actually I think 30 cities. Um, and our member galleries have expertise in a lot of different areas of the art market, everything from old master uh, right through uh, 19th to 21st century uh, European, uh, modern, and American, and also including photography, so we show all mediums. Um, The association uh, is now 52 years old, and we have had, uh, as kind of our um, uh, bright light, the art show, which is now in its uh, 27th year, which will be in March of next year. Um, one of the things I'll just mention that I think is pertinent to the conversation is, you know, how do, how do galleries, you know, participate in this incredibly competitive world and that's one of the things I think about a lot for the Art Dealers Association of America. We're trying uh, and actually Tony Carmen has been extremely helpful in branding us. I don't know if you've seen on the flags around the fair the ADAA logo. I think we have something like 43 members who are participating here. But the association you know, stands for scholarship and expertise and knowledge one has to qualify in order to be a member of the association. Um, And, of course, there are many, many great galleries. It's not that they're only the galleries of the ADAA, but um, I think it's interesting to to know that art dealers stand for something. Um, Brooke has asked me to comment a little bit on new collecting patterns and how collectors uh, who are both, you know, new to the game and seasoned uh, collectors like Sandra, navigate. And there's a tremendous choice in the marketplace today. Uh, one can come to an art fair and see you know, 164 galleries from around the world. One can go to uh, an auction house, and there's practically an auction uh, every month someplace in the United States. Um, the internet is a tremendous source of information, as well as now becoming a place where uh, e-commerce is conducted. Um, And the thing that's very uh, uh, difficult and tricky is that uh, these are all kind of LAs by which people uh, travel, but they don't always intersect. So there are people who, for example, go to auctions, but they don't necessarily come to galleries. Um, I do still have clients who come to galleries, and they don't necessarily go to art fairs, for example. I think that there are a tremendous number of um, people who have grown up with the internet of a younger generation that uh, prefer to navigate on the internet and to find their way in that in that sense. Um, uh, And in fact, I think they conduct business uh, through sites like Instagram, where they buy and sell works of art. So these are parallel but not necessarily intersecting worlds. I think that collecting patterns, and I'm making a very simplistic kind of um, uh, analysis here, Um, collecting patterns fall into three areas of the market. Um, There is the the new and emerging, which is an intensely competitive market, uh, not only for the people who represent the artists, but also for those people who are interested in buying in that area. 
Um, there is the middle market, which I would define as artists who've been showing their work for probably between 10 and 15 years. They may have had a very upward trajectory for a period of time. Uh, not always easy to sustain. There may be, there may be a, a, a plateau or even a, a slide uh, downwards for them. Uh, galleries, uh, many of them have represented artists for a long time. They have to you know, really work hard to keep these artists in the mainstream. Um, I think one way in which they've accomplished this is often to try and showcase very established artists with artists who are uh, coming onto the scene to show that there is a connection, there's a dialogue and a narrative within which artists work. Um, then there's the top end of the market, which uh, encompasses the trophy works that are sought after by um, both new and seasoned collectors. Uh, and these are people, I think, who are largely treating art as an asset class, uh, where uh, they're looking for things that are extremely rare, uh, that have um, uh, a, tr a tremendous history in the marketplace. Um, it also can include, um, in terms of the, the buying group, a certain number of uh, you know, new museums uh, that we've all read about that are in the Middle East that are trying to form collections by going out and searching out these pieces and often paying uh, prices that are, are just absolutely extraordinary. And, and this is very headlines grabbing. So uh, what are the biggest hurdles in, in collecting today? Um, I think that one of the biggest hurdles is access, um, which means that you have to have knowledge of persons or people who are the gatekeepers to the art. And along with having these connections, one has to have money. Um, because in the most competitive sectors of the market, where whether it's the, the emerging or it's the high end, uh, there are typically now more people interested in buying art than there is art available. And this is uh, something that you have to work at. Um, the second most difficult thing to overcome is the wall of intimidation. And that is how do you know who to go to and who to trust? Um, I think that the best way to collect on any level is to uh, make relationships with experts and to mine their knowledge, um, spend time looking at art firsthand. There's absolutely nothing that can replace uh, the relationship with a dealer who has knowledge to pass along, along with the pleasure of looking at art. Now, Kenneth is going to address Thanks. Uh, building an institutional collector, where the idea came from, what the impact is. Uh, thank you very much. So um, I'm Canis Prendergast. I'm here because I put together a collection, or we put together a collection for the University of Chicago. Um, but I'm not also trained as an art person at all. I'm actually an economist at the University of Chicago. So part of what I'll tell you is actually my economics hat rather than my art hat. Um, I feel like as we built the collection largely through happenstance. We moved into a new building and we needed to put something on the walls and now it seems to have developed this rather formidable life of its own. Um, I feel like I've gone through a process that some of you probably have already gone through or may go through, which is, uh, as Dorsey mentioned, there is this wall of intimidation that starts when you begin in the art world. A lot of the institutions of the art world are largely meant to overcome one problem, which is, most people often don't know what they're buying. You know, there's many things that we buy that we don't know much about them. So I know nothing about fridges, but I find out how to, what, I, what to buy when I buy a new refrigerator. You know, and we do it through seeking all sorts of information. But it's an even more difficult market to navigate the art world. I've sort of studied markets. It's my job to study markets. The art world is the most complicated market I've ever seen. You know, it's really taken me 10 years. I said I had gone through the process. And the process I went through was one where I was like the babe in the woods that knew nothing 10 years ago. And now I feel like kind of the gnarled veteran where I kind of know how the whole thing sort of works. But it's an extremely difficult market to navigate. And it's extremely difficult to navigate first for the reason that it's, you know, with most things that we buy, okay, so think about cars, think about houses, think about everything we do. 
The thing that gives us confidence is that we seek advice from people that have no vested interest in whether we buy. So we go online, we find out whether somebody likes a restaurant, we find out reviews of cars, we find out whatever. That's almost impossible to get in the art world. So part of the difficulty that everybody faces is, how do I navigate very expensive purchases in a world where often I'm just throwing darts at a dartboard? And I think a lot of what art fairs do and really what the gallery system does is the gallery system is set up in a very sophisticated hierarchical way where I know what certain galleries mean. They're, they are brand names in exactly the same way as an artist is a brand name. And what you do is you largely navigate, as Dorsey said, you navigate it through that process. The other thing that's really strange about the art market relative to most is that with most goods that you think about buying, if you have the money that's posted for that good, you can buy that good. Like, I know how much a Mercedes is, I know how much my house is, as long as I have the money, I can buy it. That is not true for a big tranche of the art world, okay? And as Dorsey mentioned, the key thing that matters for a certain class of art, particularly both ends of the spectrum, which is the young emerging people where there's a frenzy for a certain subset of artists, and also very, very established people. You know, if you wanted to buy a Vajja Selman's painting, you don't just pay the money, you have to get okay, you have to get the okay to do this, okay? So at both ends of the market, the key thing is not do I have the money, but do I have access? And the thing that I kind of realized, and this is the process that we have gone through in the business school collection, is that when we started, nobody knew who we were. And I think, to be honest, there were some galleries that doubted what a business school was doing collecting art. You know, they thought that we were doing it for investment reasons, and we're not. We're doing it purely for consumption reasons. But by now, we've sort of developed a collection into something that's seen as a very good collection for artists to be in. So we get access in a way that we never did before. So, so much of it comes down to what position am I in the totem pole? What position are the galleries in in the totem pole? And that matching process is, even for me, and I know this process pretty well, it's still pretty difficult to navigate. But for people starting out in the, in the art world, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. So, in some sense, I'll take two more minutes. Um, in some sense, that's sort of how the art world always was. Okay? It was always this issue where you were trying to match unknown tastes of, to unknown quality. But the thing that's really changed over, say, the last 10 years is largely people... There's two things that have happened. One is um, the financial crisis. And what the financial crisis did, was, in my opinion, is, is it basically bifurcated the art market. So it bifurcated in the following way, which is at the very high end, as Dorothy mentioned, there's a lot of people collecting art as an asset class. So you look at the very top of the art market and prices have gone completely crazy. Okay, so that's sort of thing we all know from essentially reading the newspaper. But it's had a very weird knock-on effect, which is it's also resulted in a lot of the young emerging artists are being collected basically as lottery tickets. Okay, there's a hope that they're going to become that person. The truth of the matter is, if I'm 55 years old and I've been making art for 20 years, it's pretty unlikely I'm going to be that person. But if I'm 30 years old and I've just got an MFA and I'm a painter particularly there's a chance I may be that guy. And that's where a lot of that frenzy is. So basically, the frenzy is at the most expensive end, the lottery ticket end. But the bifurcated part, and this is actually where a lot of the University, the University of Chicago locates itself, are the middle tier that Dorsey mentioned, the mid-career artists who, who, even though there's a sense that the art market is booming, it's not booming for them. It's booming at both tails. But a lot of the really terrific art that we collect for the university is in that middle sector. Um, and it's largely, and it's also because of the way the art world works, which is it's become a trophy market. So some people collect art not just as an asset class, but they collect it for status reasons. They want to say they have an X on the wall. So what that means is you have in language of economics, you have what are called right tail markets, which is there are winners and losers. And everybody wants to have the winners. And that's where a lot of the lottery ticket buying is coming from. So that's sort of both. both how the art world is kind of weird, and the art market rather is weird, and how it's set up, and also how I think it's changed over time. Thank you. Now, Hugh's going to address managing and protecting a collection. Also, there are now various ways you can monetize a collection, and that's really new. Uh, we have Ashel Edelman in Manhattan, who now has a firm which specializes in this so that you could sell your collection, and then lease a, uh, somewhere between 6 and 10% of the total, 
sales price, so you still get to keep the paintings on your wall. And this is an increasingly attractive methodology. Thank you. We're fortunate at Northern Trust to work with wealthy collectors and their advisors, both across the United States and outside the United States. And I tend to think about collectors as being in uh, one of a number of stages that would include the building phase of a collection, the expanding phase of a collection. They may have reached a place when they truly become investors in art. They become knowledgeable enough, and indeed their ownership and divestment practices are more like that of an investment professional. Um, and then many will become donators of artwork, and at some point, artwork has to be divested. It has to be uh, disengaged from, let's say, uh, mortality would be the last of the reasons that that occurs. But let me offer a couple of comments on each of those phases. <clears throat> the first would come in the building phase. There's so much attention today being paid to issues around provenance, and um, Dorsey would be better qualified to comment about that than I would, but I would make a couple of observations that that's critical for collectors today to understand, particularly on older works, what the history of possession is with the artwork and to have adequate documentation about that history that would include certificates of authenticity, references in catalogs raisonné, um, contemporary collateral that would refer to the artwork, history of its, of its lending and display, et cetera. Provenance differs slightly from a legal concept of title. Title, in essence, tells us who is it that is legally the owner of a piece of art, and that becomes important with respect to some of these financing issues. It also becomes important with respect to divestment, whether by charitable gift or by private gift. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But interestingly, with all these interests uh, in all the interest in provenance and title, there are, of course, companies that now have arisen to meet the need. So there are companies that offer title insurance. There's one domestically, Eris does this. There's also a Lloyd's syndicate, a Lloyd's affiliate that provides um, primarily title insurance. They also offer some protection around the area of provenance. But I think most critically with respect to managing a collection is the issue of property and casualty insurance. And we work with collectors around that in part in our capacity as a potential lender, but also because we often hold collections of art in the divestment stage in our capacity as a trustee and as executor. And um, we are periodically called upon to put art collections out to bid. And while we approach the very best underwriters, I'm always surprised to see that there are times when underwriters choose not to bid on collections. Um, I speculate that there are times when they have enough exposure in terms of their underwriting liability that they may see we're over a little overextended on artwork and we're not going to bid on that. But I think it's very important to have not only the comprehensive insurance, but to have a competitive bid process to ensure that the collection obtains the most competitive and comprehensive insurance that possible. In the expanding phase, I'll offer a couple of context or comments about art lending. We have a lending practice. As a matter of fact, we have several colleagues here who um, are active in that area. If you'd like to meet them, I hope you'll touch in with me afterwards and I'd be happy to introduce you. But we find collectors who have reached a point where in, in the um, progression of their collection, they may want to acquire new works, but may be in a liquidity position where it's uh, more, more advisable for them to borrow rather than to dip into their portfolio. And so for wealthy individuals with diverse art collections, uh, we will accept a diverse collection as collateral to allow them to use then lending proceeds to expand their collection. And it's a very useful tool, particularly in this low interest rate environment. Uh, we have a, a growing practice in that area that really facilitates the expansion of art collections. I'll also comment briefly about something called a like-kind exchange. That is something that we may be more familiar with in the context of real estate exchanges, but the Internal Revenue Code has recognized for many years um, the, uh, the attractiveness of a transaction where an individual holding something, an artwork in this case, may exchange it on a tax-free basis for another artwork of, of a similar nature. The collector cannot do this, but an investor may. And how the Internal Revenue Service defines investor is something that's the subject of several court cases. I won't go into those details, but I will say that um, the major firms know how to structure tax-free like-kind exchanges. 
and they require very careful planning. They're subject to timing constraints and very significant restrictions around documentation, but it can be a nice way in the um, expansion phase for collectors to expand their collection without having to recognize tax on the sale of an artwork. Art is, in my uh, way of thinking, a disfavored asset as a capital asset. It's subject to a very high rate of capital gains tax, 28% on collectibles. And so any way that one can avoid that when exchanging a work of art is advisable. Investing, a couple of brief comments about investing. I think we see more clients today who think of art as an asset class. Some have become, in a sense, collectors and investors by virtue of great acquisition. And with that may come some investment attributes. Interestingly, there was a study published by New York University in 2002 that led to something called the Moses May Index. Um, the article is entitled Art as an Investment and the Underperformance of Masterpieces. They studied the prices of artwork at sale and auction from 1875 to 2000. It's a scholarly article that really looks at several things, one of which is how does art perform against other major art, cla art or other classes of assets. Um, broadly speaking, their discoveries were that it outperforms fixed income, it tends to underperform domestic equity, but most importantly, it is lowly correlated with other classes, other classes of assets, which means that art tends to zig when other assets zag. Um, and that's, a, that's become, I think, a definitive study on art's position in a portfolio as a low correlated asset. Let me wrap up with a few comments about the last two categories, donating and disengaging. I think it's important as families move on toward later stages in life to ask themselves an important and foundational question as to who will enjoy their artwork after they no longer do. And if their answer to that question is their family, this then leads into estate planning and a series of other questions I'll mention in a moment. If it leads to the public, it will lead to charitable planning and important questions about whether or not a public museum will accept a collection or will accept it only with an endowment and under what conditions they might accept it. It may lead the donee or the donor to consider creating their own museum in the form of something called the <laughs> Private Operating Foundation, which is a tax-exempt organization that enjoys some of the attributes of public charities. A number of the uh, well-recognized organizations today, um, such as Crystal Bridges, the Eli Broad Foundation, are structured as, um, as operating foundations. But the questions that I think are very important for uh, collectors at this stage considering donation or possible dis, uh, disengagement would be, first of all, is to think about the collection and with good advice ask one critical question. Is it a collection, i.e., is its value as a whole worth more than the sum of its parts? That's very important, irrespective of the avenue one chooses toward estate planning and private use or possible contribution through a philanthropic technique. But if it leads to um, continued private enjoyment, then I think collectors have to ask very important questions of their family. Will they enjoy the works of art? Will they enjoy them in the same way that we have as collectors? Secondly, will they be able to afford to maintain the collection? Can they display it? Can they ensure its proper care? Um, can they uh, uh, afford um, to in do all those things that are necessary to protect its value? Um, and then lastly, how will they plan for the liquidity that's necessary because an artwork that passes to a family member will attract estate tax above certain levels. We're fortunate to be at a very high exemption environment in the United States today where every individual enjoys, um, I say enjoys, that's an odd thing to say about an estate tax, isn't it? Um, every individual is granted uh, a substantial exemption from federal estate tax, $5.34 million, twice that amount for a couple. But nevertheless, a couple with a very significant collection in excess of that value will have to undertake some sophisticated estate planning to transfer those works to family members. There's some very good techniques uh, that we don't have time to discuss here, but it is possible to do so and leverage those exemptions in order to bring that art to family members and ensure continued enjoyment within the family. I think it's 
Hi. It's interesting to note that there are an increasing number of novice collectors coming to the field. And we've never seen so many percentage-wise. Don't you agree? Oh, yes. Um, I mean, I don't even know how you would uh, calculate a, a number per se. Uh, I think that, you know, you can start by even thinking about how many people go to museums these days. I mean, the attendance for museums uh, has been tremendous, and I think it's um, uh, very much a symptom of a changing world where, you know, art has entered kind of into a new arena of uh, uh, popular enjoyment. And I think that, um, you know, certainly, again, the Internet has done a, a tremendous amount to enhance uh, people's awareness of what it means, you know, what, where, where you can see art, um, where artists exist. They exist in so many different places. I mean, uh, not just in, in galleries and, and art fairs and museums, but, you know, they exist in the virtual world. Very good point. But when you think of the growth in interest, you think of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's now open seven days a week. Uh, the Louvre in Paris is uh, looking at a 30% increase in attendance over the next two years. We see the proliferation of art fairs, which is huge globally. Um, well, I think, can I add something yeah. to that? You know, um, the one thing to keep in mind when you come to an, a, a show like this uh, or any number of the other art fairs, these are, they are organizations where you have f a lot more applicants than you have people who are here exhibiting. So to a great degree, these have been, you know, galleries that are selected with some uh, certainly criteria of what is interesting in terms of what they're doing, what their programs are. I mean, I'm talking about the bricks and mortar galleries at home who then come together in places like Chicago or Miami or Basel, Switzerland. These are really the creme de la creme of what's happening in the art world today. So it's important to recognize that there's a, uh, a level of expertise and um, this is a bit of an overworked word, but curating that goes into who shows up at these particular events. It's important to recognize that. Whereas, you know, the internet, you have, don't have quite those same filters um, unless it's a very particular e-commerce site. So I think that, again, I get back to this idea of expertise. This is an important thing to recognize. We're looking at galleries that have achieve something in the world and have something to offer that we think is of, you know, aesthetic value. Can I add, yeah. let me add to that? I, I don't think we use the word curating enough. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that there is such a role for that. Um, and you may not agree with what any particular curator is doing, but there is some educated mediation going on, whether that's an art dealer selecting the works for a booth at a fair or putting together a, an exhibition in the gallery. And uh, you can learn by finding out why they made the choices they made. And the, to me, collecting is an a self-education process anyway, and, and that's a good place to start asking questions. The other thing, and, and I'm not really an old fogey because I did grow up in the computer business, but I think um, if I could give you all an assignment, uh, before you go to an art museum or before you go to a gallery, look at the images online or pick an image that you're going to see in person, look at it online, and then go look at it in person and see the difference that that makes. I think you need to have that mental calibration before uh, I mean, I think it's great for surveying online, but there's nothing like standing in front of a piece of art. Can and I, Can I pitch in here? For, yeah. Let me pitch in for one second. So I, I agree with everything that uh, both people before me have said, but to some extent I take the opposite side of this, which is I think there is a lot more interest in contemporary art, but my own personal view is that the reach of contemporary art is far too narrow. 
I think that it's basically it's a visual way of thinking about the world. Okay, so think of other cultures that we have, film, literature, whatever. Their reach in society is vastly bigger than contemporary arts is. And I think part of the reason for that is that even though more people are coming into contemporary art, this comes back to what I said at the beginning, I think there are huge barriers to entry for the average person to be interested in contemporary art. I mean, I noticed this personally because we put this collection together and one of the constituents that we put the collection together for are MBA students. And I've been astounded at how much um, nascent interest there is in contemporary art. But most art students are not the shyest people in the world, but they're actually genuinely intimidated to go into a gallery. And I think part of what happens in the contemporary art world is even though there is more interest, I think we could do a much better job of making it more open to people. But when you speak of barriers to entry, don't you mean primarily barriers to ownership, or do you mean barriers to exposure? Uh, both, actually. I think there's a fear of not understanding. I, I think part of the real difficulty with part of the real issue with contemporary art. In some sense, it's exactly like my world. So my world is doing research. Research is only valuable if somebody hasn't done it already. You know, t to be honest, it's relatively easy to copy. If you're a good MFA student, you can copy. And part of the contribution in contemporary art is doing something that somebody hasn't done before. And I think that obstacle to understanding is very difficult, and people feel intimidated. They're not going to understand. I do think that's compounded in the context of ownership, because if somebody says you have to pay X thousand dollars to basically participate in this market. It's both an expensive market, as Dorsey says, but also there's the fear of, am I buying the wrong thing? So I, my sense is that I think that contemporary art is a truly wonderful thing, but I, I think as a society we could do better at opening, breaking down some of those barriers a bit. Very interesting in that, you know, we're seeing people at a very young age begin to collect. And that is relatively new. You know, people in their 20s. Um, and if you look around the fair, you'll see people of all ages. And we're just seeing clear across the board, as we mentioned before, uh, entering the art world. And just the fact that you're here is proof of that. Chris and I were speaking earlier about the way in which we've seen students engage with art. He at the University of Chicago, I serve on the advisory board for the Block Museum of Art up at Northwestern University. And one of the primary missions of, of that museum is the engagement of the student body to expand their not only exposure to works um, and understanding their aesthetic qualities, but to raise questions about them with respect to um, larger issues, social commentary. We recently uh, learned of an, a significant bequest of a number of uh, posters of Toulouse-Lautrec. And uh, looking at those, you can look at those through a number of lenses, as period pieces, as uh, remarkable early examples of public art. But you can also look at them through the lens of a social commentary. And students, I think, are yearning for that kind of engagement, something that takes them, and I may drift a little far here, pull me off if I do, um, out of the digitized world in which they spend a lot of time and exposes them to something tangible and something that I think has a deep message, uh, in some cases existential, some cases social, but something that causes them to think about our world in a different way. And I think that's an important role, particularly for contemporary art. Oh, yeah. You look at the work of the Chicago-born Theaster Gates, who's with... Uh, Ravi Gupta's gallery, and yeah, what were you going to say? Uh, never mind. <laughs> okay, okay. But that's really interesting work in that it is social commentary. He would actually call it a social practice. It's somewhere at the edge between community development, workforce development, and art making. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, are there any questions? I think that, let me let me just okay. add though. I think as a as a new collector or as a thinking about being a collector, um, you used a word, and I and I think it's important to think about it, and that is successful or right or wrong. Or I have trouble with those terms. I think you have to be really um, kind of self analyzing about what success, what you, why you want to collect. Uh, and and so, 
if you're in it to make money, that's a different set of criteria and a different path than the joy of living with it. Um, you also, I'm sure you're all aware, have a little uh, problem on the investing side in that you buy retail and sell wholesale because you <laughs> usually have to pay somebody a commission to sell it for you. So uh, you're, not, you're, not, you're only going to break even if the art appreciates, say, 20%. Uh, but if you're in it to own it, somebody asks us, we, we do uh, museum collection visits, and very often people ask us, well, how do you decide to sell something or to deaccession it? And our answer is, is when it stops talking back. We want mm -hmm. art that engages us, that we want to live with. That's success, and it's when it doesn't do that that we figure out a way to replace it with something else. So it's... You know, collecting is really a continuing dialogue, and it's really about continued growth visually and historically. Yeah, we don't own anything we bought the first 20 years, maybe 25. Because your tastes change, your interests change, the art changes, what becomes available. You couldn't, you couldn't buy conceptual photography when we started collecting. You could buy photography, pure photography, but we weren't interested in that. We were interested in when it started to come on the market, um, the stories behind it, uh, what was in the artist's mind, um, why they made the choices they did, and what it causes you to in what way it causes you to see the world differently. To me, that's always the big question and a piece I want to own. What, what has it awakened in me that has made me think differently or see differently? Because to me, that's the role of the artist in society. Yeah, very much so. And um, I'm going to ask Kness to talk about sort of the impact on students, what percent he sees as uh, beginning as collectors, you know, this exposure early on to contemporary art? I, I think when I became involved in contemporary art, I had a view that I had this very arcane interest that about 500 people in the country had. Um, but, I mean, as I said a few minutes ago, I've kind of been astounded at how interested our students are not in decorative arts, but actually in conceptual work. I mean, our collection is largely conceptual. And many, many students have come to me subsequently and said, look, I've always liked art. I've been kind of interested in contemporary art. What do I do next? And, and usually I sort of try and walk them through the process. But the process is complicated because, as I said before, there's like this very sophisticated hierarchy of galleries. and. I know where they fit into that hierarchy and they differentiate themselves in various different ways. So usually people ask for advice and the one piece of advice I give, which is probably just about the last piece of advice that organizers of this art fair are going to want me to give, is I suggest you do nothing for a year. And the truth is, I, I bought things as soon as I got interested in contemporary art, but truthfully I did not know my own taste. I mean, and. Sandy said this a minute ago, your tastes change, and your tastes change a lot at the very beginning. You look at something and you think, this looks great. But two years later, you look at it and you think, you know, X and Y and Z did it before this person. So there's a common prescription that people give at these kind of sessions to say, buy what you love. But I think the problem with that suggestion is you don't actually know what you're going to love. You know, it'll probably take you two years to realize what you're going to love. And if I was to give one piece of advice, and it is the advice I give to our students, is just go to everything. Show up to galleries. Show up to museums. And in some sense, going to museums doesn't really answer the question because you're not buying a Cindy Sherman. You know, you're buying something that you see at an entry-level gallery, and only by going to the galleries and going to that level of level, I mean level in the sense of new artists, emerging artists, can you actually begin to calibrate your own taste. So my suggestion would be to immerse yourself for basically a year or two and then decide what you want to do. And... I personally feel you have to see more than one work by an artist. It's like trying to tell a trajectory from seeing one point in space. Um, you know, the, from one piece of art, that artist could be going in 360 different directions, and you have no idea until you've seen multiple works by the same artist. 
I do think that when you go to contemporary museums and look at particularly um, multiple artist exhibitions, you can start at least to identify galleries that show artists because they've often lent the pieces to the show. You can identify artists you like and therefore go to those galleries or you know find out what other artists those galleries show. So it is, it's something of a treasure hunt and it takes time but um, it's pretty joyous time. And I think it's also uh, when it was mentioned, you know, you are sort of limited by just buying one work of art. It's that it's interesting to note we're seeing more and more artists go into multiple medium, like uh, Paula Crown here, who she's with Marlborough. She works in aluminum. She works in alabaster. She works in paint. She works in photography. She works on paper. So. If you just see one work, you don't really have an appreciation of the enormous range that she works in. So you want to try and get a sense of the breadth of an artist. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. It's a question and a, an inquiry, like inquiry for commentary. Um, as a new collector, some of the things that, even working with well-known galleries, I have an art advisor. N no one talks about the tax implications. In fact, a half a dozen galleries today told me, "Well, I can ship it to you from New York, and you won't pay tax." Where do you live? <laughs> Where? I live here. And 45 states in the United States have a use tax. That's correct, which I think is voluntary. You, it is until yeah, they maybe. find out, and it, then they say, well, then they send what you have you bought? It's only voluntary in terms of what you put on your tax return. Correct. States right. are becoming far more careful about being able to find that kind of thing. That's right. And there's very little, if no, discussion about that until, until you get approached well, about your purchases. Yeah. And um, I think that that kind of advice or pointing a collector to a, a, a tax attorney to structure their collection in the best possible way in terms of um, capturing expenditures to offset the profits, because Art is an investment, whether you're purchasing it to enjoy it on your wall. It, the amount of money that you put into it, you need to be responsible for those expenditures that you aren't informed about or aren't expecting, w whether it's having the right insurance or having the right UV protection on your windows or having the right tax structure. And I think it well-known galleries do you a disservice by saying, and you won't pay tax if we ship it to you? Well, I think the thing that needs to be examined is the bill of sale, because a bill of sale should always indicate whether or not you are paying sales tax, or if you are not paying sales tax, you are obligated to pay the use tax where you live. This should be on a bill of sale. Uh, I mean, we do it at our gallery. I'm not going to tell you everybody reads the bill of sale carefully, but it is there. So in part, it needs to be you're looking at things. And if you have a question, I think you should ask a tax attorney whether you're, you're liable for something. I have, and of all the pieces I've purchased, none of the bill of sales has mentioned tax. Well. And they're very reputable dealers. But I think it's important to recognize that that's not their primary business. They're, they're dealing in art, and it's why I think um, Dorsey's observation about getting good counsel on that is important, particularly if you wish to be treated as an investor in art for tax purposes. That's, a, that's a, an important distinction between a collector and an investor. An investor enjoys certain tax benefits that collectors do not. That's an area where it's very important to obtain good tax counsel. 
I, I agree. I just feel like it's a disservice when galleries, inc it, it's an added incentive for them to ship it to you because then you won't pay tax, but that's not really accurate. That's a sales technique. That's not tax advice. <laughs> Okay. Thanks. Hi. Could you elaborate a little bit more on this uh, parallel of a 1031 exchange as far as uh, uh, pieces are concerned? You know, in a, uh, resale. I'm maybe using the parallel of re real estate. Or is it too technical to go in here? No, I'll make some brief comments. The, uh, the, the technique I referred to, a like-kind exchange, is authorized under Section 1031 of the Internal Revenue Code. And it allows uh, an investor, again, that distinction is very important, to exchange a work. In many cases, it's been real estate, but it's being used more in the artwork, art world to exchange a work of art for a piece of um, um, equivalent or greater value. And if that exchange is properly structured, there will be no recognition of the, of the built-in gain, assuming it's an appreciated work of art. You wouldn't use that technique for an artwork that had not appreciated or had lost value. You'd only use it for appreciated work. Um, it should be a work you've held for at least a year, and the new work or the replacement property has to be of equivalent or greater value. And then there are some very significant constraints around timing, documentation, and um, also in the reporting of this. But it, it, it is a useful technique um, that can be, I think, very advantageous in, in expanding a collection or a deaccessioning works. So what I was asking is, in real estate, it's fairly common. In real estate, it seems to be a, very, very, a fairly common practice. <clears throat> and I guess I'm a little mystified by what you say when an, only an investor can do it, or some qualified investor, or do, a bank has to do it for you. Well, when I use the term investor, that it's, um, it's a distinction between a collector, someone who collects for their own enjoyment, versus someone who invests in art for the purposes of making a profit. And there are a number of criteria that one would use to distinguish the investor from the collector. It would take too much time to go into those. Uh, those criteria have been refined in a number of cases in the United States that um, have laid out what some of those are. Your own tax advisor could help walk through what those are. I think one of the reasons that we're uh, that we're hearing more about it is because of the um, uh, fluidity and uh, in in the art markets and the fact that people are selling works, acquiring new works, but it's not available for someone who buys for aesthetic purpose, uh, the collector. Uh, so you can't use a like-kind exchange, for example, on your house. You can use it on a piece of investment real estate. And similarly, if you're collecting to for the enjoyment of the artwork, you're not going to be treated as an investor. It, it could be that with a particular work, you might be able to qualify yourself as an investor for a particular work, but that will take careful counsel and a number of steps over a period of time to differentiate yourself from that of a collector. It's an area where you need careful counsel. Um, the, I'm, a, I'm a tax accountant, and the key issue when you're dealing with in making the investor status, you should read a case, it was from the 19, 1969, called Reitzman. And the Reitzman case defined this investor status and what the Reitzmans did with their huge collection of uh, art throughout the country. So... That would be, if you want to know what makes an investor, and it's very hard to do, to establish invest, investor status rather than collector status. Okay? Thank you. That's exactly the case I was referring to. I'm glad you quoted it. Um, it's Reitman, 1970 Reitzman versus U.S. If you want a citation, I'll give it to you afterward. But it looks at a number of factors, the investor's expertise, the degree to which they use advisors in the collecting process, the, uh, the adequacy of their records, uh, it, it's a difficult status to obtain. Hi. Hi. 
Uh, I've got a general um, commentary uh, question that I'd like to ask uh, Hugh and uh, Brooke. The, um, the situation with the Detroit Art Museum, what do you, how do you think they're leveraging their collection with the financial state of, of the city? I mean, do you think it's, what are your thoughts on that? Oh my goodness, that, that's a question in which all of the panelists could comment. Um, I, I, it presents some very difficult issues with respect to municipal assets. And I think we could make some comparisons to municipal assets in the city of Chicago, for example, parking meters, bridges that have been sold. Um, and it raises a very important question about what purpose that municipal asset fulfills in the well-being of that city. I have a, my own personal view about the Detroit Art Museum and its collection, and that's that it should remain sacrosanct and should not be subject to those to the claims of creditors. And one, for one reason alone, in that the donors of all those works gave them for a public purpose. They did not intend that they would become assets on the balance sheet of a municipality in bankruptcy and subject to creditors' claims. I think it's, uh, I understand why creditors are asserting that those assets should be treated as um, attachable, so to speak, for purposes of satisfying their claims. But I think it would be a great violation of that, um, of that museum's mission and the role that those works play in the public well-being of Detroit. But I'm sure others have views here in the panel as well. I think most people, most people in the art world believe that the collection should be protected. Absolutely. Yeah. But the, I think the, the, the problems, I don't know, arise from the peculiar ownership structure of the museum not actually owning the work, and that just complicated it immeasurably. But certainly my preference would be that the Detroit Art Museum had an art collection. Well, and the bigger question is if, if there was something catastrophic where the collection was sold, they're, they're just eviscerating one of the most, you know, fantastic and beautiful parts of that city, which you can't replace. Okay, we're right at five o'clock. Um, we just want to urge you to walk the floors of the fair and, you know, study the works and what appeals to you. Uh, Ask questions. Okay. 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 Yeah. Thank you.